I'm amazed that I've got uh, so far in my career um, without writing a book, I guess. Um, I started my career as a working economist in um, the uh, mid-1980s at the CBI, and good to see some colleagues from that period, including John Cridland here. Um, but having served on the Monetary Policy Committee and been involved in such momentous events in the global financial crisis, uh, I feel I had to say something about it and something about where we are now. I'm very grateful to the Centre for Policy Studies for supporting this launch. I hope my book is true to your principles, um, certainly sound money, competitiveness, uh, and not running down the British economy, which is a very common uh, sort of occupation, particularly in the media. Um, when Diane Coyle, who's here this evening, told me she was um, commissioning a series of short books of about 100 to 150 pages, I thought, yes. Now, I can get this book done, and it won't have to be too long. <laughs> People might read it, um, and it's sort of within my scope. And I would like to thank Diane for the idea. I think it's, it's a brilliant idea, and there's some other books in the series here, and there will be more to come, um, of having something of that length, which you could read in a, a sort of a, a long train journey on a, on, a, on a plane or something like that. And I'd like to thank London Publishing Partnership, who... Um, published the book, and um, uh, both Diane and LPP I'd like to thank for being so tolerant with a sort of novice author such as I am. Of course I realised when I got into it why I hadn't written a book before, um, because it is hard work, um, and uh, so I must also thank my, my wife who's here, Anne, and <laughs> my, my son, um, and my daughter who's not here I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> for their patience, and my employer, PwC, for acknowledging I was a bit distracted uh, from time to time uh, over the summer. I've received lots of useful advice from other authors, and some of them are here this evening. Um, Simon Ward, who's not here, um, was the uh, read through the whole book, and, and he was voted City AM Analyst of the Year, which I was very pleased to see. Um, he gave some useful comments. So, I'm very grateful to lots of people and all of you here this evening, but you're probably thinking, well, what's in this book? Come on, t tell us all about it, Andrew. Well, I can't tell you too much about it, because otherwise you won't buy it. Um, <laughs> we will. So, <laughs> um, there's, uh, this is not very Anglican. There's uh, sort of five, really, th five themes, uh, not three. Um, so let, let, me, let me just run through the, the main sort of things that are covered in the book. But first of all, it tries to provide an explanation of why we are in what I call a new normal of disappointing growth Western economies. And I emphasize Western economies, not just the UK. I think if you read the financial press in the UK, particularly the Financial Times, you would think the UK is a sort of total basket case among a, a world economy that's doing, the rest of it's doing okay. Well, actually, when you look at the data and when you look at what's going on, the UK is probably performing as well or better than uh, the norm for Western economies at the moment. I won't give you all the details of the analysis, but basically um, I argue that there's a, there was a long expansion that started in the early 80s and gathered momentum after the 90s recession continued to 2007. And in that quarter century, it's quite remarkable, the UK economy grew by about 3.3% on average, even if you include the recession years. It's quite a remarkable period of growth. When we were in it, we perhaps didn't realise, as, as Joni Mitchell said, you, know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Um, we didn't realise how, you know, what a good period of growth. In my, earlier in my career, we used to look back to the 50s and 60s as the golden age of growth. And that came to an end in the early 70s when I, and I started studying economics in the mid-70s when, when all the turbulence there. Um, and you will notice in the book, in my analysis, I draw quite a lot of parallels between uh, the 70s and early 80s, when the CPS was founded, of course, um, and where we are now. So, over that period until 2007, we benefited from some quite strong tailwinds in the Western economies, particularly a deregulated financial sector providing easy money, globalisation of the world economy helping to reduce the cost of imports, confidence that built up in governments and central banks. And those, those conditions have gone away now, and I don't think they're going to come back quickly, so we can't expect that growth to uh, re-emerge in the same form. So that's the, the sort of first component of the book. Um, I also discuss, a second component is, 
discussing you know, which economies are worst affected by this more difficult economic situation and what, some, which are the ones that are doing a bit better. And as I say, I see the UK in the category of economies that are doing okay-ish in the economic environment we're in. Obviously, we can always do better. Uh, but I see the poles of growth in the West as being <coughs> the United States and Northern Europe. And if you look back in history, um, and I'm a bit historical in the book, and my history A-level and all the sort of interest and history that I have come out, um, but you know, Northern Europe and the United States, uh, Northern Europe I would include the UK, have been the, the sort of bedrock of growth in the West, going back to the Industrial Revolution and then various phases of it. So that's the second uh, part of the book. And, discussion of southern Europe, and I introduce concept of the new Maginot line, given that we're at the anniversary of the First World War, uh, which runs from the Low Countries down to the east, uh, <coughs> eastern Mediterranean, so it goes a bit further than the original Maginot line. <laughs> uh, and to the north and east of that, economic prospects are much better than countries to the south and west of that. I won't go into more detail, and you can work out where various countries are. So that's the second part of the book. The third part looks at economic policies. Um, and I think you know the economic policy that I'm supporting um, are to some extent embodied in what the government is doing of getting public finances under control. But uh, there's some elements which I don't think necessarily are as strongly embodied in current government policy as I would like to see, particularly supply side policies. Uh, I would class myself as a supply side economist, um, and I think uh, in the book I don't go into lots of detail because it aims to be a short <coughs> book, but I set out the main planks of what I think the right supply-side policies in the current environment should be. The fourth uh, component of the book is spelling out the business implications, and it's good to see you know, many people here from the business world. Um, I don't say these are the winners and these are the losers, but I set out some themes uh, which I think will underpin business success in this new normal world. And one of the messages that I have in terms of business is that hunkering in the current climate, even though growth is disappointing, hunkering down is not necessarily the right strategy. Um, companies that just purely hunker down uh, and don't look for new opportunities will find that if we get into uh, a future stronger growth wave, uh, they've got behind the curve in terms of their competitors. So you, there has to be a joint strategy of, yes, being cautious and sensible in terms of finance, but also looking for new opportunities. And then finally, uh, the fifth component is looking at the prospects for a new growth phase. Uh, in, the second, uh, in the period since the Second World War, we've had two long growth phases. Uh, the one that started after the Second World War, ran through the 50s and 60s, and then ended in the early 70s. Then one that got going in the uh, early 80s and then continued to 2007. Um, and I've got a a chart which I don't actually reproduce in the book which looks at the UK and it's like two skyscrapers with those 50s and 60s growth and the 80s to 2007 and then there's a disappointing period in the middle in the 70s and early 80s and there's a current disappointing period lasting perhaps to some point in the second half of this decade. I'm not convinced notwithstanding the pickup in growth that we're, we're yet breaking through um, in the UK or on the West more generally into that next growth phase. I think we're midway through the transition in sort of Churchillian terms. We're sort of at the end of the beginning, rather the beginning of the end. But, um, you know, we're, 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 we're making the transition, and I think in the better adapted Western economies, which I would include the UK, we're perhaps making that transition more quickly than others. So I would encourage you to read the book. Um, buy it, buy it. <laughs> You've got to buy it in order to read it. Um, but I think there'll be, for, for, for people who've followed my career um, and know some of my interests, there'll be one point of disappointment, which is uh, when I was on the Monetary Policy Committee, I tried to introduce into the Monetary Policy Committee references in my speeches to rock music because I noticed that members of the Monetary Policy Committee always talked about sporting um, metaphors and analogies or sailing, you know, tacking against the wind and all this sort of stuff. Or in, uh, uh, Mervyn King's famous Maradona theory of monetary policy. And I thought, I've got to get some rock music in here somewhere. Uh, so uh, I, I gave a speech in the middle of 2010 about how long should the song remain the same. Uh, those of you who uh, know the music of Led Zeppelin, you'll know that's based on one of their albums. And, and of course, the famous Selling England by the Pound speech in February 2011, which uh, I think is still very relevant today. 
But in this book, uh, it's one thing that I didn't really do was try and weave in all these uh, rock music references. <laughs> um, so I just would like to leave a sort of parting shot that I hope when you get to the end of it, and I'm sure everyone here is going to read the book, you won't feel uh, like the who that I can't explain. <laughs> I hope you will feel like Johnny Nash that I can see, I can see clearly now. <laughs> and I hope you will feel like Bad Company. I can't get enough. And you won't <laughs> so, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if, there, if there are any questions, then uh, uh, Andrew very kindly agreed to. Yes, um, uh, Peter Cook. Um, my question is, uh, first a comment and then a question. Um, given your, your parting shot there of uh, Led Zeppelin, I was left wondering really uh, uh, whether, you, whether you think that all this economic theory and Keynesian ideas are only located in 70s progressive rock and whether Coldplay have anything to offer <laughs> <laughs> But to move on to a more important point, which you can respond to, you can respond to the other one if you like. Um, but I've read the book, um, and it isn't just a book about economics. It is absolutely, as you say, it's, it's in, written in English, mm. and it talks about sociology as well as economics. Economics teaches us a lot of things about what we should do, but of course people don't always do what they should do. So a theme in this book is about yeah, if we're going to do this, we have to learn and improve and innovate and produce you know, clear blue water between us and other people. I wonder if you could say anything about that aspect of the book, about, sort of the, I guess, the consequences. You know, words, are we doomed to failure, as uh, Dad's Army would say, by just repeating the boom and bust thing? Or can we now move to something a bit more well, clever? There's a, there's a section in the book where I talk about the parallels that some people draw with Japan. Japan had a financial crisis and had a long period of disappointing growth. Actually, more recently, Japanese growth hasn't been so bad. They seem to be sort of coming through it. But it, it definitely took them a long time to get on top of the consequences of the financial crisis. They had a long period of disappointing growth. You know, many people um, who've written books um, a lot longer than this one, so you read this one a lot more quickly to get to the point, um, have, have sort of drawn parallel with, parallels with Japan. Um, and I, I think there are some... There are some parallels, but there's important differences. And one of the things that Japan didn't do was move very quickly to deal with some of the issues. So speed of action in terms of dealing with the financial problems, uh, of dealing with public finances, of trying to deal with some of the supply side issues, which in Japan, they, they still haven't really sort of uh, embarked seriously on some of the supply side reforms, I think, that they need to, to uh, undertake to get their economy growing properly. Um, and so there's, there's a point there about speed of action. Um, I think we're in, the, in a period of transition which has three dimensions to it. It's a, it's, it's a period of transition for the financial sector. It's a period of transition for public finances and public sector. It's a period of transition for the, the business sector. I think in all those three fields, there's still you know, some progress to be made. We're sort of you know, uh, undertaking undertaking changes. I think the parallel that I think is, is quite striking is what happened in the early 1980s, particularly in the UK um, and the United States, and then followed on in, in Europe. If you took 1982 as your sort of benchmark date, and actually if you look at the UK's economic performance since 1982, the UK economy grew on average, as I said, from 1982 to 2007 by 3.3% on average for 25 years. It's quite a remarkable thing. But if you if you sort of surveyed the UK economy in 1982, you would uh, have, you know, if, if I got up then and said we're going to have 25 years of really good growth, as good as the 50s and 60s, perhaps even better, I think very few people would have believed me at the time. In fact, I didn't have the confidence uh -huh. to say it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't write the letter to the, the Times. No, I didn't sign the letter to the Times that said the opposite in, in, 19, in 1981. Um, but I think at the time when things appear to be appear to be the darkest is often when transitions and changes are happening and as I said in terms of business you know business I don't think should be sitting here thinking well growth is slow and we're not you know basically we're just going to hunker down we're just going to take a, a totally cautious strategy I think businesses that do that will find that they get perhaps stranded further down the track so there's some thoughts.
Well, 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 sorry. Uh, over there and then Lord Howe. Andrew, it's Bridget Rosewell. Um, Bridget. I should plug your book as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there's one copy of your book. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, why didn't you bring more copies? Um, I think I he has. It's about Andrew. He's got them in the boot of the car. Andrew, which is more important at the moment. Uh, and I did sign the, the letter of the economists and mayor culpa. I probably shouldn't have done, but I was young and naive at the time. <laughs> but what I want to ask about is, does slow growth matter? So there are a lot of people out there at the moment saying, well, does it matter if its growth is slow? After all, you know, we're all quite well off. This is all quite comfortable. What is the problem here? Uh, I think there is a problem if we, if we have slow growth, but I think we need to articulate more clearly why growth matters. And indeed, maybe we should be looking for that kind of minimum level of growth, which is sufficient to enable us to provide public services or all the other you know, activities and assets that we actually want to provide. Do you agree and, and, and do you have a view on what's the minimum level of growth we should be aspiring to? Well, there's some aspects of growth which we can adapt to. So if growth is slow because, because of demographics, so the population is growing more slowly. And if you look across at different countries in the world, you can see uh, the United States has traditionally had a much stronger growth rate on average than the European Union, but a lot of that is to do with demographics. They just have a stronger population growth. And you can see some countries in the world now, like Japan, Germany, Italy, which have you know, very low population growth, and that's a dampening impact on their growth. But you, know, you can adapt to that, uh, and you know, adapt to, to an aging population in terms of you know, if people start working longer because they're living longer. Uh, you can still keep the same proportion of the, the, the um, population in work. I think at, at some point, and I don't know where this point comes, uh, you, you know, getting back to 3.5% growth or 3% plus growth, it seems to me to be unrealistic. But if you then, some people then say, well, you, we can live with a zero growth economy. But it seems to me a zero growth economy is, is something that is quite difficult to manage because it basically means that if I get better off, somebody else is getting worse off. Um, so it, it almost creates a, a zero-sum game sort of mentality in the economy, um, which is why I think you know in rapidly developing economy, in, in sort of uh, economies are starting from a low living standard, it's very important that it, you know, they can get high rates of growth, um, because if, if if growth was at the expense of other people, it would just push people in, you know below the poverty line. So um, I don't know what the magic number is. Um, I, I think to some extent we can adapt to a lower rate of growth for a while. But I wouldn't be too fatalistic about it and say that we can't do better than, if you take the average growth rate of the UK over this recovery, it's been, you know, even with today's growth figures, it's probably been around about 1.5% on average since the middle of 2009. I think we can do better than that. I don't think we can get back up to 3%. Um, and, and sort of the, the you know, without making <coughs> too deterministic forecasts, the, the sort of the next growth phase will probably be somewhere in between. Um, but I, I think there are some challenges of you know, adjusting to a lower growth rate, but I think you can manage them more easily if it's a, it's, it's a temporary phase rather than you know, sort of a very long-term um, secular stagnation. Uh, a lot of people want to ask questions, but even more importantly, a lot of people want to buy books. <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll just take, 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 take the last handful, of, and if everyone can be brief, I'd be very grateful. Lord Howe, uh, 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 there, uh, uh, and Brian, who's for this all is. So, uh, uh, first of all, I'm very glad you mentioned Japan because we all this focus on China. We all forget Japan's nine times richer per head than China, and much more likely to be the engine of growth in Asia than China. But that's so the one I really want to ask is this there's a sort of vacuous phrase around which we heard a lot of after Lehman about rebalancing the British economy. Mm. Now, in fact, as time goes by, we seem to be rebalancing it, but not in the way intended, in that our services and uh, our red is a rapidly growing sector. 40 yeah. 41% of our export earnings come from services and rising. And I wonder if you'll touch on that in your book, particularly the fact that uh, the creative industries, including the music industry, <laughs> are, Absolutely. are one of, emerging as one of our major exports. I mean, this is rebalancing in a very satisfactory way, but it doesn't seem to be recognized yeah. by the economic profession very much at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'll come back. Shall we have to take all the questions yeah, there? Yeah, I'll exactly. just address the points. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about uh, something that you don't particularly address in the book, uh, which is the question of sort of European integration of the euro. What you do say about it is generally positive in terms of integration has been a good thing, you know, for free trade mm -hmm. aspects mm -hmm. of it. But clearly there's one of the big questions in terms of our local regional economy is the, the euro and the, 
the problems and the north-south divide yeah. that maybe the euro has exacerbated. And I was just interested to know what your perspective on, on that is. How long you've got? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, William Schomburg from Reuters. You, you talked about um, the confidence in central banks as being one of the factors that helps uh, create the conditions for growth over a long period. Is there a risk at the moment of <coughs> that confidence in central banks being eroded? And I'm not talking just in relation to the, the forward guidance issue, but I am asking uh, also about the forward guidance issue. Mm. Yeah, well, if I pick that, I'll, I'll go round and I'll dance. I'll, I'll throw those points. Yeah, sorry, Ryan, did you? Yeah, just Picking up on that, since, since, since the 1980s, we've obviously um, been through various monetary regimes, as it were, sort of high monetarism, exchange rate targeting, uh, independence of the Bank of England, CPI inflation. What do you make of the increasing sort of intellectual movement towards nominal GDP level targeting? And is that something that you'd support? Well, if we just, just stay on monetary policy in general, I mean, I think. Um, one of the things I learned through being on, on the MPC, monetary policy has to be forward-looking. If I have a concern about monetary policy now, it's not forward-looking enough. It seems to me that the challenge facing monetary policy is to manage the exit from you know, the quite dramatic steps we took you know, in 2009 to get interest rates down and do quantitative easing and so on. And you know, I would be worried, uh, you know, people in the business community, I think in the public, um, while it, it's difficult to pin this down, to, to my mind, their confidence is to some extent affected by the fact they can't see quite how we're going to sort of manage our way out of it. Um, and some people are not bothered about that, and they think, oh, well, I'll just get on you know, day to day. But when people are thinking forward, I've been very struck by talking to pension funds recently. Pension funds are very concerned about what the transition is going to be in terms of interest rate. It makes a very big impact. So there's, and there's, there's quite a few parts of the economy. I don't think the solution is some sort of new gizmo, sort of nominal GDP targeting. Nominal GDP you could have reference to, but like everything else that has a sort of intermediate target flavour, it's it sort of, um, it, you know, you, you shouldn't make it the holy grail. Mm. I think the, the key thing for monetary policy is, um, you know, price stability should be the broad overall objective. Um, and I think central banks are not sort of focusing enough on this, trans this, this exit transition at the moment. On the euro, um, I, I mean, the main message in the book is about the north-south divide in Europe. I, I'm not so sure that you can say that, that the euro contributed to that in the sense that it created very favourable conditions for the southern European economies. Um, and therefore there was sort of less pressure on them to sort of undertake you know, policy changes and to address their sort of fundamental competitiveness issues. Uh, in the early phases of the Euro. Um, would it have been different if we hadn't had the Euro? <laughs> I'm not so sure. Uh, maybe they, they would probably have a higher interest rate, so they would have had a, a sort of weaker exchange rate. Um, I think it was partly, I suppose, I think that whole era, you know, from the 1990s onwards, there was far too much thinking about along the lines of, you know, we've got it all s sorted in terms of economic policy. And I think that, that was the sort of big mistake. Uh, and perhaps the southern European economies uh, you know, should have used that opportunity a bit better. But I think from where they are now, I, I'm, not, I'm far from convinced that getting out of the euro would help them. I think that you know, they, they face major sort of issues in terms of their public sectors, in terms of competitiveness and so on, which have to be um, you know, dealt with irrespective of whether in the euro or out of the euro. And I, one of the things that depresses me actually most about the UK's economic debate is the sort of belief that devaluing your currency mm. is, is the solution to the problems, because that underlies the sort of prescription of saying, let's get out the euro. Um, you know, as someone who's started studying economics when the pound was in free fall, um, you know, which it, it fell very sharp between 1967 and 76, I can't find any correlation between the devaluation of the pound and actually a positive economic growth. It's generally the other way around. So um, I, I'm sort of anti the devaluationist tendency. And I think, I think it's quite striking that the countries in southern Europe are sticking with the euro and choosing to sort of make their adjustments inside that regime. I would like to reassure Lord Howell that in my book there is, a, there is quite a bit about the importance of services to the UK economy. My favourite fact on this subject uh, services exports account for 12% of UK GDP. In terms of our main 
uh, continental European counterparts, Germany, France, Italy, it's about 6% of GDP, and for the United States, it's about 4% of GDP. We stand out in the G7 as, you know, the, the, the really big exporter of services. And it's a very, and some people say, oh, this is just financial services. As you say, it's a very diverse basket. <coughs> My sort of parting shot is that, um, you know, working for PwC now, uh, business and professional services um, account for uh, a very large slug of that sort of export of services and has been the fastest growing sector in the services sector uh, over this recovery. And so on this posit that positive note, I will encourage you all to buy the book. And thank you once again and thank the Absolutely. Centre of Policy Studies. I'm, I'm glad you won't get to mention things can only get better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to be a popular choice here. <laughs> thank, you, Andrew, thank you, Andrew, very much indeed. Do uh, buy a book. <laughs>